morning again. I'm Bill Cristol. Uh, thank you, Jimmy, for having us. Thank you, Rich, for the, the excellent remarks. Um, I don't think these my fellow panelists here need much introduction, but I'll give them give you a very brief introduction. Uh, Peggy Noonan, um, I met first when she served in the Reagan White House, and I came to Washington to uh, work for Bill Bennett. And she was an illustrious celebrity, and I was a little peon over there in the education department, which, hard as it is to believe, was not at the center of people's preoccupation <laughs> in the mid-1980s as, as Reagan won the Cold War and got the American economy going again. But Peggy was very nice to the little people like me, so I've always had a soft spot for her. And she's gone on to a very distinguished career, obviously, in journalism, commentary, and so forth. And her <laughs> book, which was published just after President Reagan left office, as I recall, um, President to the Revolution, I think it was called. What I saw. What Peggy saw at the White House is really one of the best memoirs. Having then worked in the White House for four years, I would say is one of the best uh, memoirs in the sense of really capturing what it is like to be a senior staffer uh, in a White House and a real window into American government in general, but obviously uh, the Reagan presidency in particular. Uh, Bob Schultz um, graduated from Stanford in 1974, uh, joined the Navy, was a Navy SEAL officer for three decades commanded Navy SEALs all over the world, retired as a captain, what, about eight, nine years ago, and uh, like has done other worthwhile enterprises uh, since, teaching, mentoring, uh, working on issues of leadership, and it's an honor to have you with us, and thank you for your service, thank and um, uh, looking forward to hearing from Bob. And it's great to have Gary Kasparov, who went to a lot of trouble to be here, and we really appreciate that. Uh, probably the greatest chess player of all time, that's, I checked that with Charles Krauthammer and he said it was okay <laughs> to say that. <laughs> so Charles is a little bit better. Charles is a good chess player. I myself peaked around seventh grade when I was, you know, <laughs> like the third best chess player on the, you know, little club team at our school. I decided chess was too hard, but chess is too unforgiving, you know. So then I decided bridge was more interesting because you could sort of, you, you can know. You blame your opponent. Yeah, you can blame, right. And, and, you, and, and they make mistakes and, and then you have a partner you can blame when things go wrong. <laughs> Then I realized bridge was too hard, and I ended up with poker, which, <laughs> uh, which I'm not that good at either, so it's really... <laughs> so I'm, I'm somewhat in awe to have Gary Kasparov. Uh, since his career as a chess champion, he's been, of course, a great um, activist for democracy and human rights uh, in Russia itself, but also beyond Russia, uh, and really, I'd say, one of the world's leading spokesmen uh, for the cause, of, a cause that was so dear to Jack Kemp of human rights and liberty and democracy uh, everywhere, not just in certain places that where it's easier to achieve. So it's a great group. Um, I'll be quiet. I'll, I'll ask Peggy, then Bob and Gary to speak just five minutes or so, maybe a, 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 on a particular aspect of the American idea. Maybe we'll have a little conversation, then a, a broader discussion. Peggy. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, and good morning, and Jimmy, I'm not sure where you are, but thank you. Thank you, Jimmy, for inviting me to be part of this. It's an honor to be with members of the Kemp family, Joanne, uh, and with these panelists who are, I know are going to speak uh, thoughtfully about Jack and about leadership in general. Uh, it's also good to see in this room so many former comrades in arms of Jack from the 80s and from the 90s and uh, from that group that helped him, I believe, change uh, the world. And also a few young scholars here, very good to see. Um, I do not remember Jack Kemp with sweet nostalgia. I think of him, and often, with an active respect, and sometimes to a degree with a wondering uh, as to how he would see the current moment. Uh, my Jack, briefly, is Jack the tax cutter, the economy grower, the Jack of Kemp Roth, uh, the dynamist who could see that lower rates would help produce higher growth and get that kind of dynamism that Rich referred to when he was painting Lincoln for us, get that going nationally. Uh, this is the Jack with utmost faith in the American people get out of their way and they will produce wonders, period. Um, my Jack is also that famous figure of inclusiveness and outreach. We somehow, as we say that, it sounds like a cliche. It is not a cliche. It is the big thing politics needs now. Honest inclusion of individuals 
not so much groups, but people. Bring them in, talk to them, have a real conversation with them. Uh, he was the jack of empowerment zones and governmental creativity, whose central insight, I believe, was that the economy had to work for everyone, that all boats must rise together, that you don't want only ocean liners and cabin cruisers out there rising with the swells. You want an armada of all kinds of ships, big and small. The other day I was reading uh, in a magazine about the great war photographer, Robert Kappa, who covered, as you know, D-Day. Uh, when he arrived, before the invasion began, when he arrived at the English port town from which the invasion would be launched, he saw, he was stunned to see as far as the eye could see, uh, not only destroyers and carriers and launch boats and landing crafts. He also saw, to his amazement, fishing boats and skiffs and tugboats. It really was a modern armada. That, I suspect, well, that at least is connected in my mind with how Jack Kemp saw all the ships of the American economy going in the same direction together. Uh, I, 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 we're going to have a, a long conversation in a minute about leadership and about various things that are on our minds. But you know, I found um, uh, Rich's talk so stimulating that I wanted to add three things about Abe Lincoln that I think about sometimes just as an addendum to him, uh, to Rich's remarks, and then I think bring it back to Jack. Um, one of the things that has always interested me, like Rich, I have been probably like most of the people in this room, I have been a great reader since a child about Abe Lincoln. He is a fascinating, dramatic, compelling, and moving figure in American history. So there are small things I think about with regard to him. One is everybody who ever knew Lincoln and all his biographers note that Lincoln walked funny. Lincoln didn't, didn't uh, move forward on the ball of his foot or on his heel. Lincoln clumped. The ball of his foot and his heel hit the ground at the same moment, and it gave him a funny, odd gait. It was very stable, uh, that gait, but it was also... Um, inelegant and awkward looking, and people sometimes teased him about it and sometimes imitated him. His secretaries in the White House did. I have a theory on how that gait came about, and it relates to something Rich said. As, as Rich was giving us a little portrait of the wilderness, the backwoods wilderness in which Lincoln grew up, Lincoln didn't grow up walking on paved streets. He didn't grow up walking where there was any pavement, not when he was a young one. Abe Lincoln walked through fields, and he walked on paths. And as everybody knows who lives in the woods or has ever lived in the woods, when you're walking on paths cut in the woods, you are constantly going over roots and, and rocks and things that are coming up. And, and I just have a theory that as a kid, he learned the only way to get through that, those paths was to have a very sure step and just put the whole foot down. Um, I don't know why that interests me so much, but it does, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. It just does. Another thing, Lincoln is Whig, which Rich uh, mentioned. I think Lincoln very much desired, you can see it throughout his remarks as a young man in politics, he desired the building of an American infrastructure. He did want those canals. You know, he wanted pathway, pathways and he wanted bridges. And of course he wanted the bank, but he wanted this country built up. I think um, he wanted that for all the reasons that Rich uh, mentioned. It, it would be good culturally for America. It would be good for American business. It would help the entire edifice of the country build into something with time substantial and even wealthy. But on top of that, I think, um, 
Lincoln was a human being, and human beings all have conscious and unconscious hopes. And I look at Lincoln's life, and one of the things you see is that Lincoln knew and was capable of expressing as few others who knew what he knew. Lincoln knew that the wilderness was lonely. It really was bears looking at, it, at, the, at the creek, at the break in the timber in your little house. There were no people around for miles. A big Sunday or Saturday was going seven miles away to the local town. And that town was huge. It had 23 people. America was a lonely place. And this was a boy who was having a lot of thoughts, a lot of things clearly he would have wanted to talk to people about. There was no one to talk to about it. I think part of Lincoln's, this is pure speculation on my part, but I think part of Lincoln's Whiggism um, sprang from knowing that America needed to come together because Americans needed to come together. They needed to know each other. And that place, that fabulous country, needed to be less lonely. Final thing, not really related to what uh, Rich said. I think sometimes about Lincoln and his famous depression. I don't know if a, a million writers have written about Lincoln and the blues. When he was young, he got the blues really bad. When he was a young man, um, there were times, there, were, there was at least one time, maybe two, when he was somewhat suicidal. He was considered by his friends to suffer from clinical depression, although that phrase didn't exist at the time. However, as you read Lincoln, as you see him rise in the world, you don't, and, and as you read Billy Herndon and everybody who wrote about Lincoln and knew him and was his friend, as Lincoln was rising in the world, there are fewer depressive episodes. By the time Lincoln got to the White House, I think there were no depressive episodes. What Abe Lincoln had in the White House was appropriate sadness. He was the president of a country in a terrible war, torn in two. His wife's family was literally torn in two between uh, Union guys and Confederate guys. It was the bloodiest five years in American history. Of course he was sad, but he was not depressed. He was not in this terrible funk where he was wordless and incapable of communication. So what do I think that is about? I think in part it was about this. When Lincoln was young, before he rose, before he, rose he knew he was a genius. And he was a genius. I think he was our great genius president, arguably, although you could make a case for Jefferson, our only genius president. But he was a literary genius and he was a political genius. He was a man of profound subtlety and ability to see patterns and acuity and knowledge. I mean, this guy was something. I can't believe I just said of Abe Lincoln, this guy is oh. something. <laughs> but the, this guy is something. All right. I think when he was young, he knew he was a genius. He knew it, but he knew nobody else knew. And he knew something worse than that. He knew nobody was ever going to know, because he was the backwoods boy walking over the roots in the path, and he was never going to get out of that place. He wanted, as Rich said, to get out of that place. And once he did, and once he started to rise, He was less subject to his demons and suffered from only the appropriate things we all do. How does this get back to Jack Kemp? I think history is human. I guess it's one of my themes as a writer. History is human, and the people who make history are human. Jack, and we should have Joanne speak later, but Jack is someone who was innately optimistic. That was part of his personality, I believe. Not a fool, but a man who had well-grounded hope. Some optimists are optimists just because they're stupid. That was not Jack. Um, Jack was also a football player. He wanted to make progress. He wanted to move the ball. He wanted to win the game. This was not a passive philosopher or thinker. This was a guy who was moving that ball forward. 
And this was also a man who surrounded himself with good people as he waged the wars he waged. I'm not sure that's the right word for Jack. But as he moved the ball forward, he surrounded himself with good people who could help him make progress. Those are three big talents for a political figure to have. That's part of why I think about him sometimes. I think I went over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peggy. It was, it was worth going over. Um, the, uh, the world may, you know, may not much remember or, or may little note nor, nor, nor remember what the rest of us say here, but I personally will remember Peggy's account of Abe Lincoln's gait and his, his, and also your imitation of it. I think you really need to, after the panel, after the panel, you need to stand up and do it across the whole, that's the whole room. Me. I mean, that's, you know, that would be the highlight, honestly, <laughs> with all due respect to my colleagues. Um, Bob Scholl. Um, I've recently been inspired by the immigrant experience. It's become something of a cliche that we're a nation of immigrants. But in my recent experience, I've run into a lot of them, and I thought that many of these people, a large percentage of them, had to leave everything they knew, had to take enormous risks, had to show great courage to leave their homeland and come to America. My forefathers did, as did, I'm sure, many of you, of your forefathers. And I think about the courage that that takes to, to go off into a land where you don't know the rules and may not know the language and how much our country was formed by people who did that, who showed that great courage. And when they got here, they only expected the opportunity to work <coughs> and to strive and survive and do better than where they were before. And when I think about the two of those together, one, the courage to leave everything they knew and their friends and family and to show up someplace and only have, have nothing given to them and have to work and survive by the sweat of their brow and just to have an opportunity. I'm inspired and recently I heard the story of Meb Kaflazi who won the, the Boston Marathon recently. Uh, first American in three decades, a couple of years earlier he'd been the first American in several decades to win the New York Marathon. He grew up in a refugee camp in Eritrea. And nine brothers and sisters, and the story of his father and how his father was able to get to America and bring his family over here, and Meb shows up in San Diego, which is where I'm from, and he's a local hero as well as an American hero. Uh, age 12, doesn't speak the language, and goes on to these great things. And a friend of mine knows him well and went to an Eritrean meeting or celebration of Meb's uh, accomplishment and he said he was one of the only white faces in the room and in a room full of refugees, a people full of black faces who had come to America and they started the meeting off with the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America. And he was moved and realized how much that meant to them and how he took it for granted. And I listened to all the voices speaking accents I didn't recognize, serving me fast food in the airports coming over here and driving the cabs that took me from the airport to the hotel and realize that this immigrant experience is still alive and still happening. I shift focus quickly to another organization and I'll come back to that in a moment, but uh, I teach with the National Outdoor Leadership School and they teach, they teach leadership and character by taking people into the mountains, into the wilderness and small groups and people have to deal with the adversity of what the environment offers them, being outside their comfort zone and deal with the challenges internal, the dynamics of that small group. And the, the gem, the jewel of the <coughs> crown of their leadership philosophy is this thing called expeditionary behavior. And expeditionary behavior basically means that to make the expedition work, everyone has to do their share and then some. And their share begins with taking care of yourself, taking care of your, your own needs so that you can contribute to the rest of the expedition and not become a burden on the expedition. A second jewel in that crown is the idea of tolerance for uncertainty and adversity. And 
when you go, when you leave the comforts of civilization, you go into the mountains and the wilderness, you are forced to deal with uncertainty of the weather and the terrain and the adversity of being away from the comforts we've come to know. Coming back to the immigrants, they had to have this tolerance for uncertainty and adversity to leave their home and to leave <coughs> their friends and family and come to this country. But they all counted on communities to take care of them, to help them out, to give them a, to give them a shove, to get them started. And Meb Kaflazi was counted on the Eritrean community. And I know people in Southern California, the Vietnamese American community there is so so tight. When people come over, they bring them in, they help them get them on their feet, and then it's up to them to make their own way. And the, the, the Iraqis that are there, and so many of us know people who have come over recently, and these, these communities which take care of themselves and struggle and find their way in our country, I think are an inspiration to me and are also a, should be a source of inspiration for all of us as we think about the American idea uh, and how they embrace it in a way that it's easy for us to forget about sometimes. And for them, the American dream is not an entitlement. And many who have lived here for many generations begin to see it as an entitlement. For them, it's an opportunity. And they fulfill the American dream by being able to strive for that opportunity. And I encourage us to continue to look at immigrants and the immigrant communities for inspiration as we consider America. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for those challenging and perceptive uh, words. Uh, Gary Kasparov. Um, I will talk about leadership. And um, um, I grew up in the Soviet Union. And of course, we learned about the United States of America and about the West from Soviet propaganda. So I had access probably to some other source of information. But still, we knew about two worlds. And uh, people like me always recognized America as, the, as a moral authority and as a country that you know, could offer a hope for, for liberation. Um, and it's, it's quite a pain now to see the decline. So, and it's, it's easy to blame just the current administration, but I think it started uh, much earlier. So the first time I visited the United States was 26 years ago, in 1988. I was 25 years old, so that's the so fresh Welsh champion. And it was just first experience. And that's the last year of Ronald Reagan. And, um, and I think that since Ronald Reagan left the office, so we had four administrations, two Republicans, two Democrats, and I think they have been gradually destroying the credibility of, of the US presidency. And I would like to concentrate on this word credibility. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just America, the strongest military power in the world, still the largest economy. The, the danger comes from the fact that the words of U.S. president are no longer considered to be some sort of ultimate red line, as was at the time of Ronald Reagan or Harry Truman or JFK. Um, it's not just Obama's infamous red line disaster in Syria. I think it started earlier, and uh, I think the last two administrations in fact, contributed dramatically for the destruction of credibility from opposite sides. Because you don't want to use force all the time, as unfortunately, in my view, was done by the previous administration. And you don't want to depart from use of force, as is being done by the current administration. You want to make a credible threat. When Reagan said, tear down this wall, that was an ultimate red line, and they believed him. Yeah. And I remember, you know, that's the, the stories of uh, early 80s, um, and is the, uh, the Soviet propaganda getting absolutely crazy about Ronald Reagan's statements, evil empire, and then Star Wars. And later we learned that it's as much as it was probably pure fantasy, the Star Wars just was Reagan's dream. And it, was, it had such an effect, profound effect, in the minds of Politburo that it led, I believe, it led to the collapse of communism. The Soviet scientists told Politburo, impossible. It cannot be done. It's Reagan's fantasies. But the power of the US presidency, the credibility was so high, yeah. the Soviet Politburo believed American president, an actor from Hollywood, more than they believed their own scientists. <laughs> 
And, and that's what was always, you know, the strength of the, of the uh, United States, credibility. Um, okay, I will talk more about it just, you know, when I deliver my keynote, but I think it's pr appropriate now to mention it. That when in 1948, Joseph Stalin, and don't tell me that Stalin was less dangerous than Vladimir Putin, wanted to take over West Berlin. And Harry Truman ordered the airlifting support, by the way, against the advice of his generals who wanted to, okay, give it up, as now many recommend to give up Ukraine. Uh, why, for 11 months, American and British planes have been supplying West Berliners with all they needed, water, food, and Stalin didn't give an order to shoot a single plane. Because as every dictator, he had a great animal instinct. He could yeah. smell when there would be a powerful response. Harry Truman used nuclear bomb already, and yeah. Stalin had no doubt, this man will do it again. So again, it's not about using force, but it's about posing credible threat. And I think that now it's the, 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 uh, the utmost importance, utmost, most, uh, it's, it's a goal of, of, of this country, is just to restore the credibility of the office. I mean, just to make sure that when U.S. president makes a statement, he will not be forced to use military power. The threat will be sufficient. That's how the world was saved uh, 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 during the Cold War, and that's, I believe, the, the only way to move uh, into the future. I mean, I just... Couldn't um, help but quoting Jack Kemp that I'm not a hawk, but actually a heavily armed dove. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, of course, political leadership is a policy from principle. And uh, there are principles and uh, there, it's the, there are responsibilities of the United States as a leader of the free world. Um, just to prove that the words about you know, carrying the torch of freedom is not just you know, statements. But that's, that's why America earned its place in, 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 in the history of human race. And that's what we all are looking for now to be restored. Um, I remember when, yeah, just during the Syrian crisis, um, people asked me whether it was, it was the, it's a game of chess and Putin played a better chess uh, while Obama played some form of checkers. Yeah. And my response was that it's, it cannot be compared to chess. It's more likely like a game of poker. And Putin, as great dictators of the past, he was very good in bluffing because he could smell weakness. Dictators, they always grow without weakness, with indecisiveness. The cost of, of, of preventing Hitler from becoming a monster in 1933 was less than in 1934. In 1935, less than 1936. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's like a cancer. You have to intervene. You need surgery. And, and, and every day of delay, makes it more challenging and more difficult. And eventually it could be almost impossible. So Putin bluffed, having a very weak hand. I said Putin probably had a pair of 10, but he acted as if he had a uh, flash royale. Obama had a very strong hand, say full house, but he flashed it in the toilet. Mm. So uh, it's all about recognizing that, you know, it's, just, it's, it's the politics. When you deal with, uh, with politicians, who do not belong to the same part of political spectrum, dictators. You have to recognize it's not, it's not a game where you have a win-win outcome. It's eventually a zero-sum game. And you can win only if you show strengths. And uh, again, these strengths yet to be regained. And uh, again, we, as in the late 40s, the world now is looking at the United States to provide this leadership. And uh, this leadership is not of building coalitions. No, it's nice to build a coalition, but coalition cannot be coalition of equals. Everybody knows that the coalition without the United States is not going to work. And when you hear from the White House concepts like leading from behind, you just recognize that it's a recipe for disaster. So leadership means you are in front. Leadership means you bear responsibilities and you may pay a high, you know, high price for that. But again, that's the, that's the burden of leadership. And America did it once, and I hope it will do it again and again. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Jimmy told me before this panel that I should feel free to say a couple of words as well. Maybe I will, maybe I will do that since uh, Gary quoted this. I remember Jack saying, actually seeing, I can't remember when it was, early 80s, I think, 
I remember Jack saying, I'm not a hawk, I'm a heavily armed dove. <laughs> and thinking to myself, I, really, I'm just a hawk, you know? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but if Jack wants to be a heavily armed dove, you know, that's fine. We have, we have a wide, big tent, big spectrum in the, <laughs> in the conservative movement. But obviously, to be a heavily armed dove, you do have to have the credibility to use the weapons. As you say, Truman had the credibility in 48 because of what he had done in 45. And the U.S. had the credibility in the Cold War because of what it had done in World War II and in, in Korea and, and elsewhere. So I agree. Obviously, one doesn't want to indiscriminately use force. But um, at this point, the, the bluffing has gotten so, so uh, well, not bluffing even, just the red lines have become so ridiculous that uh, it's very, you, you get into a very dangerous situation, as Gary said, where people don't believe. It is the classic recipe for war to be weak, to say you're going to do things, to not do things, the dictator that eventually overreaches. We do eventually do something, of course, or so I think. <laughs> and that is, unfortunately, it looks like the, the path we might be going down. I, I want to say one word about Jack Kemp and, and his legacy that's always struck me and I think is underappreciated in a way, which is the pure, well, two, two words, two points, the pure political entrepreneurship of Jack. I think people just forget after, if you had to be around, and I wasn't in Washington, but I was in college or grad school or whatever, in the 70s to realize how much he was willing to take on the conventional wisdom, how much he was willing to take on the establishment, uh, both the liberal establishment, obviously, but the establishment within his own party, and not just on the famous tax cut issue, where one forgets how much they disliked him, how much they resented his coming from nowhere. He wasn't a member of the House, he wasn't, not only was he not chairman of House Ways and Means Com Committee, he wasn't a member, as I recall, of the House Ways and Means Committee. He had his crackpot tax cut plan that it, you know, was supported by about eight people. You know, Bob Bartley, my father, and John Mueller, Joe Judwinski, and about five others, you know. It was the business community wasn't interested. They wanted a capital gains tax cut and immediate expensing and, and depreciation. <coughs> and, uh, obviously, people who wanted bigger government weren't interested in tax cuts. It wasn't orthodox economics at the time. The degree to which Jack personally took that from what, in 74 or 5, from a couple of articles in the public interest in the Wall Street Journal, to the campaign platform of a Republican presidential candidate in 1980 is really astonishing. How many times has that even happened in American history? We're not talking about 20 years. You know, this, he did this in five years. And he was a backbencher, a pretty new member of Congress, out of power, in the minority. Um, and he did it, really. It wouldn't have happened without him. I think there's no question it wouldn't have happened without his personal leadership and energy. So uh, on that issue in particular, but I'd say on other issues as well, including human rights in the Soviet Union, Jack, I'd say, played as, so there was a democratic tradition, human rights tradition, Scoop Jackson, obviously Jackson Vanek, uh, they were both Democrats, uh, who sponsored the legislation in 74. Jimmy Carter had a sort of, let's say, distorted version of this, of this view when he became president. But Jack really put, was able to combine a concern for democracy and human rights with a more classically hawkish or heavily armed dovish type Republican foreign policy. Um, and changed Republican foreign policy between 76 and 80. The previous Republican president in 1975 had refused to have Solzhenitsyn to the White House. The previous Republican president and his Secretary of State had shunned any notion of helping or encouraging dissidents in the Soviet Union or, or in, the, in the Eastern Bloc. And really, in large part, now Reagan deserves a huge amount of credit here too, obviously, but Jack worked very closely with Reagan, I think pushed Reagan, helped give some of the bring some of the intellectual ballast in behind uh, Ronald Reagan, and really by 81, when Reagan became president, the, the, his position, the position of the President of the United States, and the position really of the Republican Party, though there was still a lot of backsliding uh, underneath, sort of, against Reagan and Kemp, was that the Republicans would stand for a principled position for liberty through the world, doesn't mean you go fight everywhere, but not the kind of uh, pseudo rail politique um, Kissingerian Ford type view. So just in two huge areas, taxes and uh, foreign policy, uh, Kemp made a huge difference. And again, as a backbench, relatively junior congressman, uh, really through the power of ideas and the power of his own uh, efforts. And I, I always cite him in, when I speak to younger congressmen or aspire candidates or uh, state legislators or whatever uh, as an example of you don't have to sort of wait in line and you know gradually go up the ladder one step at a time and defer to your elders and betters and accept what everyone tells you you have to accept in terms of the future of your party or your movement. I mean, just the pure uh, entrepreneurship and willingness and courage, really, to take on and to be mocked and, and uh, ridiculed and, uh, for some of these positions that he had, which then became the governing positions of the country. And in particular, I think, on both the Reaganite assault on the evil empire and in the tax policy, probably the two greatest achievements of the Reagan administration, really, 
so much identified with, with Jack, and I don't think they would have happened without, without Jack. So that's my only, my only thought. Um, so uh, why don't we just, we just take comments and questions from all of you and direct them to any of us, unless anyone here have a particular <coughs> comment to make? You want to oh get up and walk back and forth now? I'm not going to do that for you, maybe. Gary, I have a question. Do you, you talked about Putin and his nose, a dictator's <coughs> nose for weakness. I'm just curious, you've been watching this closely, do you think that when Putin was at the Sochi Games, such a huge showbiz step forward for him, cost $50 billion, this is the new Russia we're unveiling, it was a huge extravaganza, a huge endeavor for Putin. And how many days, or, or just a few weeks later, he goes into uh, Ukraine and Crimea. Okay. Tell me about, the, what I'm saying, I guess, is did he know at Sochi what was coming? Did he know what it's he was about hard. to do? Was this a huge head fake? What was it? Uh, it's hard to say because I don't think Putin expected, you know, Ukrainian revolution yeah. to be yeah. triumphant and Yanukovych to be thrown <laughs> out. But of course, the plans of taking over Crimea existed before. And yeah. by the way, few times Putin by mentioned that. You know, if you want to read more, uh, learn about more about Putin's plans, read his speeches. Yeah. Because all the time he yeah. mentions certain yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. So uh, he actually warned uh, 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 Bush 43 about potential attack on Georgia in April. So and his generals were talking <coughs> about it. <coughs> so it's, um, I don't think that entering such Olympics he had the Crimean plan in mind. But already in, on, on February 20th, on my Twitter, I yeah. said the Anschluss was imminent because you could see the movement. And I also think that Olympic Games is some form of intoxicated drug for a dictator because suddenly they are surrounded by the world. They are in the epicenter of public attention. But they, again, it's probably in some form of acceleration. It took Hitler 20 months from Berlin Olympics to Anschluss of Austria. And it took Putin only 20 days yeah. from Olympics to Anschluss of Crimea. Mm. Yeah. I guess you know, it was a combination of factors. Yeah. He was just, just on the very top of the world. And somebody challenged his authority, take it over. So I think it was just you know, very somehow spontaneous. Visceral, but, at least. Yes, but also I think he, he had so little, if any, respect for, the, for his Western counterparts. So that's why he didn't expect any, and he unfortunately was right, uh, any opposition. Let's not forget, six years ago, he invaded one of the former Soviet republics, yeah. Georgia. He was shy at that time to annex South Ossetia and Abkhazia, but it was, you know, an act of invasion. And what NATO did for these six years? Nothing. So when you, and from Putin's perspective, okay, what's, what's the big difference? Let's try to take over Crimea. And, and uh, it's again, it's just every day, you know, he sees that he could move forward. I mean, he will move. And especially now when he feels threatened because his position in Russia uh, as, as a man who is in power for 15 years and made it very clear that he would stay in power as long as he's allowed to, means to the rest of his life, mm -hmm. uh, requires a new, for, new form of mythology, kind of a legend. Because they don't, he doesn't have a democratic, you know, legitimacy. So he needs to come up with a philosophy. And what is a philosophy for a Russian leader who doesn't have legitimate elections behind him? Expansion. So the, the new title for Putin, a collector of Russian lands, mm. that means that he will not stop. He will, he could, and when yeah. somebody thought he would stop in Crimea, uh-huh. And then maybe Eastern Ukraine, no, he can't stop. And the real danger is that, is that eventually he will challenge NATO in Latvia and Estonia. And then what? Then so do you, that's already NATO chapter. Do you, do you want to send troops, you know, and, or you will close down NATO? So unless he stopped now, he will expand. So, and I think there's still a good chance because Ukraine is a big state, 45 million people, and definitely they're quite angry. And all they need is just, you know, full political and military backup. Military means equipment. You don't have to send soldiers. It's not about boots on the ground. It's about, you know, full commitment to protect the, 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 the victim of the Putin's aggression. And people forget, if I use that word, I mean, how many other threats we've made over the last four years that Putin has just laughed off and we didn't follow through at all. The adoptions, which was not a trivial issue, after all. There are an awful lot of Americans who have adopted 
uh, children, babies from, from Russia, and this was a, and he just cut it off, and we blustered, oh, this is unacceptable, nothing, you know. So and I it played I, very well at home. That was a very popular right. move in so Russia. No, and I think I mean it. it I just so what the Syria thing you mentioned the red line there, that that passed pretty quickly in the United States because a lot of people were against going into Syria, rightly or wrongly. But you know, civil war is a mess. Uh, it was everyone stopped fo following what was going on there. The fact that another fifty thousand people have died, whatever, it's you know causing chaos throughout the Middle East. But people don't want to think about it. It's too hard. It's too challenging. But the, I was, I'll just tell one story. I was in Japan in November first time I've been there in 20 years, and I'm a, no expert at all on, on Japan or that part of the world, but there's a small group of foreign policy think tank types and journalists. So we had a meeting with Prime Minister Abe, um, and we ushered in, sat down, for some reason they had photographers, like, oh, big deal, you know, I'm sure that helped Abe domestically, you know, <laughs> with a bunch of hawkish Americans, you know. So Abe, so they get the photographers out, and so I'm sort of the for some reason, the senior person in the delegation, you know how these things work. So I turn to the prime minister and say, well, he's got a translator, obviously, though he knows some English. <coughs> so I said, well, thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, for having us here, and I wanted to ask you about Japan and China, you know, all the obvious things. And he interrupts in English. He understands, obviously, what I said, and says, well, could I, could I ask you a question first? So we, I guess, you know, I was like, no, Mr. Prime Minister, really. <laughs> so yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yes, Mr. Prime Minister, I'd be, I'd be happy. He said, and he said in English, his English isn't that good, but I was not able to tell him, he said in English, what happened in Syria? Ooh. Isn't that amazing? This yeah. is 10,000 miles away, six, four, five months later, in a meeting that was supposed to be, was, we were sponsored by a foundation in Japan, it was supposed to be about mm. U.S.-Asia relations. Mm -hmm. It has such an impact it around the, the world. It was the signal yeah. moment, yeah. the yeah. pivotal but, moment. But Japanese take warning seriously. I mean, the red line for them, it just, it's a matter of honor. This was not about bombing Syria, Assad. It was a cred about the credibility yeah. of the office so. of U.S. president. Does anyone notice, by the way, uh, internationally, I was thinking about what, the pres what President Obama had said about Syria, the red line. As I remember it, I was thinking this the other day and I haven't had a moment to Google it, the President Obama did not say America will draw a red line on that behavior. I think he said, now that's the sort of thing, the use of chemical weapons, that would make me draw a red line. That which. Yeah, that would personal. be a red line for me. It's personal. It's, it's personal his problem. issue, his yeah. drama, it's his legacy. In the of an that, but it's it, not his issue. Yeah, he is the president of the United States of America. That's <laughs> yes, but I know. But what I mean is, to him, it's his issue. It's about him. It, it, it's different from the I, way it's been in the past. Well, it was said cavalierly in a press conference. I mean, it wasn't well thought out. It, it showed a certain lack, though, of understanding. I think if you're a president of the United States, you can't just <laughs> answer a question that way and expect, oh, well, that was just, you know, I got, got that, took care of that question for today. Now I'm not going to be bothered as I go back to the campaigning. It was right in the middle of the campaign, wasn't it? I think uh, August, of, August of 12. I guess yeah. so, yeah. Question, we've talked too much. Chris. Sir. I was struck in working for, for Jack Kemp and, and later for uh, Ronald Reagan that everything they said seriously, which was almost everything, uh, was, had a moral basis, a moral, ethical basis. When you were talking about human rights, it was because God had given each person a soul and his rights, and they were, as an individual, each human being counted. There was, that's an ethical, moral, uh, religious, based uh, judgment. And when it was arms control, it was the same. And for example, Jack, like Ray, Ronald Reagan, made a big fuss about the, honor, the, the actual honorable basis of the data and of the verification. You don't just trust, you verify. And you go to a verify, there's a human <coughs> basis and the social basis, the legitimate basis of what's being done. Uh, and you stand up against dictatorship, totalitarian in particular, and military and extremist view, because they're intolerant of this moral basis. They are realpolitik in the worst things. And the reality that Jack, and I use his first name, but almost everybody who worked with him, and I found it very difficult to impress my bosses, Jack, but what Jack Kemp and Ronald Reagan uh, did was to reshape reality 
So they were realists because they had moral basis which transcended mere politics. And they were realists because they knew that having that internal passion and drive and faith could reshape reality by leading from the back bench or from the front. And when Jack led from back the bench and he was at the front, right. he carried the he carried the man. And I wonder whether you could talk about this this subject of the ethics or the moral basis or even not even the religious basis of really, of what people like Jack Kim and Ronald Reagan were able to accomplish against the establishments of their own party, of the media, of academia, of the chattering classes, and so on. I'll make I'm a not, that question was so comprehensive. I'm not sure there's anything to add to it. Yeah. Well, I, I think what I, what, I hear, yeah. what, I hear, <laughs> what I hear is that, uh, to go back to what Bill said, uh, that Jack was an entrepreneur and he wasn't going to just sit back and watch the system and try to work his way through. But he, he asked himself, what can I do? What can I do and how can I make a difference in the realm that I'm in? And that creates its own momentum. And I believe that all of us are looking for moral leadership, whether it be for our nation or for the, the, the groups that we, we, op we operate in, whether it's the Jack Kemp Foundation or our church or our community. And so each of us can be a leader in our own world and take initiative. And hopefully that leadership is, got, is built on principles and, and a moral foundation. So I think, again, the, the idea of leadership and the American idea is taking, taking a stand and asking myself, asking each of us ourselves, what can I do? Where does my responsibility begin? It begins with me leading by example and doing what I can do. That would be my quick response to you. Uh, I remember that academician Andrei Sakharov once said that uh, uh, the decisions based on morality and principles eventually proved to be the most uh, pragmatic ones. Yes. And I remember one anecdote, it was late Václav Havel, I think it's 2007, he was in Moscow and the uh, Czech embassy had a little reception for Russian opposition activists. Um, and it just was a lunch reception, we at the table. And the Czech ambassador was trying to be very polite and cautious, just, you know, round statements, explaining to us that the European Union must, uh, you know, recognize the Russian interest and Putin's strengths and to separate the issues of human rights. I mean, just <coughs> all, all sorts of diplomatic nonsense and, and uh, Havel at one point got very agitated and he had the menu and he threw it at the table and he said Ronald Reagan while negotiating with Soviet Union with Soviet leaders the issues of nuclear disarmament always had a list of political prisoners at the table I mean that's always had what the yes. list of political prisoners oh, at the oh, table oh, oh, oh. so that's that tells everything you know, I think both uh, Ronald Reagan and Jack Kemp were very confident of the values they asserted, but they were also very confident that those values would resonate with the American people. In a way, they were speaking the American lingo because they thought in terms of the American lingo, and they were speaking to people who spoke the and thought the American lingo. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure leaders now are as confident. Uh, the second part, Gary, you just made me think of, there's a marvelous uh, quotation from, I think, Bismarck, who said, you know, it's no trick to fool a man who thinks himself clever, but a good, honest man, it can be difficult to fool him. Mm -hmm. Board. So uh, one, one of the things that Jimmy hopes to, uh, to get out of this whole thing is, a, uh, is advice to the next president, whoever that may be. And I think Gary has um, given us a good lead into that on foreign policy. Um, say what you mean and mean what you say. Um, and build your strength and don't. don't you know, don't, don't, don't be intimidated and don't let anybody mess around with you. So that's a good, that's a good beginning. That's, but I just wonder what else you see in terms of the field, and if you could be as concrete as you want to about particular mm -hmm. candidates, if you like, uh, about what, what strengths they need that they do not now have. 
typical troublemaking question from <laughs> my board. <laughs> I, anyone want to address that? I mean, I'll say a word. I thought Peggy actually said it very well in her opening remarks. I mean, the Jack's vision of a rising tide lifting all boats understood that there were different kinds of ships. You had that long metaphor about that. That was very nice. And, uh, but it was important that, they'd really d that it really uh, did help all boats rise, or almost all. I guess you can't ever have all. Um, or at least give all boats an opportunity to rise. And I do think from a Republican point of view, from a conservative point of view, uh, that aspect of the, of the sort of middle class, middle America, Main Street side of conservatism has been somewhat obscured in recent years. Um, maybe just, maybe because of attacks on Romney that he didn't answer very well, and maybe unfair, <coughs> but certainly the perception was he cared about growth and he cared about uh, entrepreneurs. He talked, I remember telling the Romney campaign once, my usual success of giving advice to these campaigns. Um, that, you know, it's very nice to talk all the time about entrepreneurs. I'm for them as an empirical, analytical matter. They do are really are responsible for a lot of the economic growth, you know. But most people go to work every day and don't dream of starting this business or that business. They think it's important that they do their job well. They would like to rise a little bit. They would like their kids to have greater opportunities. They would like to contribute to their family or their community or their church or their country. Uh, and you've got to speak to those people. It can't all be about everyone, you know, starting a business and growing to become, you know, Google or, 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 or whatever. And, and I think, and you can make a fancy argument, well, of course, but it's ultimately good if those people start those businesses because then they hire other people. But you can't, you do need to talk about citizens, uh, not just about businessmen, and, and about all of our citizens, all the boats, um, not, just, uh, not just sort of the few leading ones. Um, and I, I think that would be a lesson I would take from Jack. And I think, I think Republicans have learned that lesson to some degree, incidentally. I think there's a lot more talk about that and attempts to think through from a policy point of view. Now, this is the harder thing. John and I were talking about this. From a policy point of view, what real policies are there that address what has been a bit of a problem, a kind of middle class, working class, wage stagnation, et cetera. Uh, I'd, say, I'd say those policies are being worked on in think tanks, argued about in magazines. I'm not sure politicians have quite emerged a la Jack Kemp to sort of take uh, ownership of these different policy proposals. Though I think it's happening if you look at Mike Lee, Marco Rubio, others in the Senate, some of the governors, but um, probably still one kind of one notch away, I'd say, from real, real politicians really embracing these ideas and making the case for them to the American people. I, th I would only add that there, something that has been lost in America, I don't know, the past decade, two, whatever, is a sense that we are all in this together. I haven't seen a national political figure in, in, a, in, a, in a way that makes you believe it. Talk to the American people as if we are all the same, we are all equal, and we are all equal together. We will rise or fall together. The, the, um, this uh, uh, political, professionalism and consultancy and stuff cannot, they can't help themselves. They slice and dice the electorate. They say it's 50 plus one, that's all that matters. I see leaders who can talk to their base, who are constantly talking to their base, from the president to those who are challenging the president. The base, the base, the base. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a country out there. The country is not the base. You gotta talk to the whole thing. And if you do it in a way that is credible, the word we're using today, that is genuine to you, that is smart, that is appropriate to the moment, moment and has apt policies for the moment, you do that, you'll not only be talking to the country, you'll be winning over your base. So you can't just divide it up and go for your peace. It's a big country, it exists together. Lincoln wanted it to exist together for good reason. I mean, Ob Obama became a national figure before he was a United States Senator, people forget this, by giving a speech, probably the last speech actually, that successfully did this, I would say, his Democratic Convention speech, you know. Wasn't it? Oh, he was running. He was running. He, yeah. was, a no, he was a That's state right. senator running for a seat he was going to win, right. but still, he was not, he was a state senator, think about that. He was unusual, obviously, African American, you know, it could be a prominent figure, but still, I mean, it's, that speech really catapulted him, and that was the theme of the speech, however much it does it doesn't accord with what he's done as president, I yeah, mean, but I which mean shows you how, how powerful the message is, I think. Yeah, but he doesn't, hasn't governed in a well, way I reflective no, of I that, was, you know? I'm he was a little you. defensive, Obama, with David Remnick on this very issue in the famous 
New Yorker piece that everybody goes back to as the Rosetta Stone of the second Obama administration. To seriously see it as one country would be very different. So, as a subheading to Mort's question, um, one of the things that Jack is saying is that exporting the American idea is America's unfinished revolution. And so I'm wondering if you agree with that statement. And if you do, how should it or how does it find expression in U.S. foreign policy? Because this is not without controversy, obviously, especially in a time when we're suffering, when the nation is suffering from war fatigue and the questions of whether we should be involved in nation building abroad and what the resources require, what are the public diplomacy aspects of that, what are the military economic aspects of that. Where, where should we be going on foreign policy? Is there a role for exporting the American idea? Um, I don't like the expression exporting because that you know, reminds me of you know, exporting communism or any other ideology. I would rephrase it. I would say supporting those who are sharing American ideals. That will be more appropriate because exporting means you are trying to spread the values in the places and the countries that are not willing to do that. It implies somehow the military force while supporting those <coughs> who are willing to share these ideas, I think changes the, changes the equation, like in Ukraine, for instance, now. So those who are willing to join you know, the, uh, the Western world, in, in just not, it's no longer the same West as when I was a kid, so not, no longer the Cold War in the traditional you know, geography, but the West is the, it's, it's like a more symbolic value. So those who would like to join the world of democracy and free market, they deserve full support. And I believe America in the position to, to offer this support everywhere around the globe. I would like America to be a better example to itself and the world in terms of what America is and what it can be economically strong, culturally strong, educationally strong. These are the things that I think ha make an impression on the world. When my people came from Ireland to America, it was not because America was trying to export the American idea. It was because they heard, oh my God, the streets are paved with gold. You can make a living there. You can rise. They were poor farmers who lived out in the Irish wilderness. They heard about this thing. There was no future in Ireland. They came. But they came because America was a magnet, and it was a magnet because it was busy at that time in the 20th century trying to be its best self. So I'm very interested in getting America trying to be its best self again. For one thing, being its best self will help our economy, hopefully. And the economy pays for all of the things we are talking about. Diplomacy, when it works, costs money. And arms cost money. And to be a heavily armed dove costs money. Yeah, I was just going to add, add on that, that um, more prosaically, I was, I was actually going to reference the heavily armed dove <coughs> line, which is, you know, there's a big arms build up in the 80s. That was another thing that I think spooked the Soviets when they, geez, he's really, and the Weinberger, really, there's that famous story, is yeah. that Weinberger and Stockman arguing before Reagan about what should come first, the defense build up or reducing the deficit, and Weinberger comes in with the big soldiers and the little soldiers, you know, that kind of cartoon uh, uh, um, presentation. And Reagan doesn't hesitate, though. He first things first, you've got to, you know, be strong enough to not have to use force, to have peace through strength. Um, it was a big build-up, build and it was well worth it since we won the Cold War without firing a shot. We then, of course, typically drew down much too, too fast, probably, in the 90s. Then we had to build up again. Now we've drawn down too fast again. And I think, therefore, I mean, you can do all the uh, smart power, soft power, diplomacy, it's all great. You just need to have the ability, though, to, if you're the world's policeman, in effect, um, to be everywhere and to do things, as you know better than I. And I, I am worried that we've now cut defense so much that, and probably cut it foolishly as well because of the sequester and all that, that we are on the precipice <coughs> of sort of not being able to do things that every American president since 19, one very senior military 
uh, you know, flag officer, said to me, for the first time he believes since 1945, you, he can imagine a situation where a president of the United States calls in the Joint, uh, joint Chiefs or the c combatant commander and says, look, we need to do, uh, there's a crisis here, we need to do X. And the chairman of the Joint Chiefs would have to say, Oof, Mr. President, we can't really do X. Or we can only do X if we totally strip ourselves down in some other part of the world where we have extremely important interests and we need to keep aircraft carriers or forwardly uh, based troops or whatever. And so I do think, for me, to get back to Mort's question, <laughs> just sort of just practically speaking, I would like to see the Republican Party remember that first things come first. Defense spending is now at a historically low percentage of GDP. We're still a very wealthy country. Despite, and despite the deficits, we could afford to actually have an adequate defense. Also adequate spending, incidentally, for diplomacy. And other things, that's something Jack was very concerned about, I think. Uh, he used to criticize the State Department, not because he didn't like the State Department, because he thought they weren't doing a bad job at being the State Department. Yeah. And that's a case where I think Condi Rice and Hillary Clinton, both, I think, with genuine uh, good intentions and, and genuine sincerity, wanted to improve our actual practice of diplomacy. You know, they, bo they both actually were struck by this before they became Secretaries of State how much we have a system that's set up 60 years ago, which is not responsive to current technology, current cultural issues, current political issues. And both of them, I think, failed, really. I mean, they tried to do some things. The bureaucracy was unbelievably resistant. Uh, the whole cult, no one cared much about it at the end of the day. Bush didn't care because he was allegedly such a warmonger. Obama, who's supposed to be such a <coughs> fan of soft power, has done nothing, actually. No. That's, our soft power is not more effective today than it was no six years ago. Interestingly. So, I mean, I think that, that takes money, too, though, as Peggy said. So, I think, I think being serious about foreign and defense policy would be, uh, I think that's beginning to happen among Republicans and conservatives, at least, mostly in reaction to what's happening around the world. Um, but we still have a little way to go on that, I think. I'm sorry, you were, I cut you off, I think, Bob. Yeah. No, it's <coughs> better than what I would have said. No, I, okay, well, but I take that aside. For <laughs> but I, but I, will, I will say that as somebody who's spent his life executing, being one of the guys that sent, we, most people in the military <coughs> believe, still believe, and hope that the reasons why our leaders send us forward ultimately make sense. Though in the last... <coughs> the last decade there has been some doubt and I just talked to a young man who is thinking about getting out of the Navy Rhodes Scholar Navy SEAL fabulous young man just told me that when he was in Afghanistan he was seeing things and he was asked to do things that just made no sense to him yeah. and he talked to his fellow leaders and they said they make no sense to us either and then, he w then they said, well, have you talked to your leaders about it? And they said, no, because... So he goes and talks to the, to his battalion, the battalion commander. He says, it doesn't make any sense to me either, but that's what we got to do. And so being a bold young man, he went over his head Whoa. and said, this doesn't make any sense. And his leader said, it doesn't make any sense to me either, oh but we man. follow orders. And so I, I, I guess my point only is... is my experience in the military is that we, and I still say we because that's where my heart and soul is, continue to have faith in the system and we don't want to lose that. Yeah. Uh, and it's been shaken a little bit in the last, uh, the last decade. Yeah. Sir. Following up on that and also going back to this concept of leading from behind, I was really struck by the clarification of what the president said from the red line, and how eerily similar it was to even something he was talking about, the college ball playoff series. This is what I personally believe, which may have been appropriate for the president. Obviously, the president shouldn't be weighing in with something like that and from a governmental perspective. But when the world sees these things and it sees the president um, saying these things and then it falls hollow, um, let's say he wakes up tomorrow morning and realizes, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I want to try to actually... Um, address the situation in Russia in a, pr in a productive way. What concretely can he do, if anything, at this point? And then what can members of Congress do at this point? And obviously, preparing for the next election is different. It gives you for an opportunity to have a real <coughs> reset um, on these issues. But what could he do now, if anything? And then, along with that, what, what should members of Congress be doing to prepare for that? You know, Gary? I have a thought about members of Congress. Um, you say what the president should do. No, you work uh, at a higher level no, than, than the rest of us. As we discussed <laughs> already now, it's, it, it requires more than a few years ago because making 
a credible threat for this president is virtually impossible. Putin will not be listening. So it should be something quite meaningful. Uh, what I would do first, uh, I think it's not uh, that difficult. Uh, you will immediately supply Ukrainian army with <coughs> thousands of uh, anti-aircraft and anti-tank missiles. Again, it's a defense weapon, but it's a signal. So, and Ukrainian army is it's, it's weak today, but it's, it's, it's big enough to cause uh, uh, irreparable damage to Russian army, which is also not so strong. Uh, it's, it's much weaker than, than, than the, the Soviet army, even at probably it's, it's at late 80s. Um, also, I think uh, they have to, um, America should unilaterally uh, impose uh, meaningful sanctions against at least few key people in the Putin's immediate entourage, including their families, just to hurt them. Some people should be hurt. You know, you can't have the same calculations, oh, we, we, we impose sanctions, but that will hurt the business interest. So this is important that some people close to Putin will pay dearly, including the, their fortunes allocated abroad and connected to their immediate family. And the last, not least, Putin is, he has a good ear, he's listening. He's listening to Obama, he's listening to Kerry, not important. He's listening to Exxon, he's listening to BP. Huh. And if Robert Dudley says, we have a rock solid relations with Russia, Putin doesn't give a <coughs> damn about what White House says. Quietly explain Robert Dudley what will happen with BP if he goes against American strategic interest. Move them out, make sure that they will pay dearly for their willingness to continue business with an aggressor. That's will, then Putin will be listening. So those are the immediate things you can do without even consulting your European allies. And by the way, if you do that, they'll be paying attention as well. But it's very hard to imagine Obama doing these no, things. No, no, it's, no, it was a hypothetical I'm, question. Okay. No, 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 I understand <laughs> that. But this is the problem I come no, down but this to. Is, it was not about Obama, it was about U.S. president, actually. He didn't Understood. say Obama. Jason Blatt played chess in his mind. He wasn't playing a real, actual, you know, game. You know Congress, I mean, one, this gets back to my point about Jack when he was in Congress in the 70s. One forgets, I mean, Reagan gets the credit, as he should, for reversing things. Carter actually began to reverse things in 1980. Um, after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and the Iranian hostage crisis. Carter, who's so much derided by all of us conservatives and Republicans, with some justice, I think, but um, did actually acknowledge virtually that he was wrong and was been bugged by reality, so to speak, and did increase defense spending and did actually fairly tough things against the Soviets in 1980, uh, too tough for the left wing of his own party, which is really a contrast with Obama, too, where there's been no incent, no, in I mean, the reset with Russia, I was always skeptical of it, but you could have said at some point, it wouldn't have been crazy to say it, it wouldn't have been politically damaging, I don't think, to say, look, it was a good faith effort. We thought we had to make the effort. Maybe Medvedev was more independent than we thought. Maybe there was blah, blah, blah. You know, and now we know, okay, it didn't work, and now we're getting, adopting a different policy. He won't even say that. I mean, that, which is really startling, because I think it would actually help him even politically to say it. There's a kind of stubbornness with Obama that wasn't even yeah, there with Carter, true. which is a problem. But, Getting back to the point, I mean, Reagan, um, he didn't come from nowhere, and there were a lot of people in the House and the Senate fighting Carter's foreign policy in 77, 78, 79 in pretty concrete ways, saving weapon <laughs> systems that Carter wanted to get rid of, leaving yeah. troops in Korea, that Carter wanted, which Carter yeah. wanted to remove, stopping an arms, rather major arms control treaty that Carter wanted to go forward uh, with, which had, incidentally, his bipartisan support at the beginning from Ford administration people as well as Carter. And Scoop Jackson and Jack and John Tower, and there were many others whose names have sort of are more obscure today, um, really made a big difference, I think, in they did some things, but they also helped frame a debate, which made it a lot easier for a presidential candidate to make the kind of points that Gary's making. You can't just show up in sort of 2016, I won the nomination, uh, here is, you know, I'm going to lay down five propositions, and people look, well, where'd that come from? It is important to spend, if you believe what, what Gary's been saying, and I, I think what I would agree with, to spend the next, for people, to, for serious elected officials to spend the next two years making some of these arguments, I think. Yeah. So I want to get to some questions about the strategic leadership of the future. And, you know, we think of Nixon with his disruptive diplomacy going into China when everybody thought that, you know, was crazy. And, of course, we talked about Reagan and bringing down the Soviet Empire. So I want to throw out the idea, you know, with this new election that occurred in India, which is very disruptive, getting rid of a Congress party after all these years, and the fact that, you know, nobody, we haven't really talked about Iran, 
and what's going on there. And what I am hearing and from a number of really interesting thought leaders is that we're seeing a new axis really form with Russia, China, and Iran. And that the U.S. has to think very, very differently now about who our strategic partners and you know alliance is going to be. I mean, I have two sons that uh, one's an, an ensign and, and a marine, and I'm very much aware, you know, about the, the pivot to Asia. And the fact that China has this incredible deep water from the Navy, you know, the, all the cyber attacks coming from China, you know, the theft of our intellectual property. I mean, the, the China thing is very, very serious for U.S. security, and now with their you know, secretly doing things with Iran and Russia coming. This is, to me, a very, very serious thing. But I'm just going to throw out, what about, you know, with this new change in India, really beginning to forge a new relationship? We have it beginning with India, but also think about how we bring in Latin America. I mean, countries like Brazil, huge, huge major players in the economy. And, and you know, going into Southeast Asia and try to really think of how we're going to do some kind of a uh, strategy to deal with the Iranian situation, but not in just the traditional ways that we're hearing to do right now. I think we need some disruptive thinking on how it, because Iran is sort of sitting a little bit at the fulcrum of some of this, exacerbated by what's happened in Russia. Can I, my 20 second response, I'm thinking along as you're speaking is, I feel like in the past 15 or so years, certainly since 2008 and the economic crisis, America has been undergoing in the world a status shift. You feel it when at the United Nations you go to some reception every October, the whole U, every leader of the world comes into New York and there's a big UN meeting. And there was a little fizz 20 years ago when the Americans came in. Now there isn't. Now they don't think America is such a big deal. We've suffered a status shift among the leaders of the world that has to do with money and the perception of American wealth and debt. It also has to do with leadership that was either clear and incorrect or hopelessly muddled, ambivalent, and weak. So I feel to address all of the things you're talking about one way or another, we need a creative way of admitting and turning around the status shift. That means a leader or leaders who are more certain in advancing American interests in the world, but also more capable in igniting the American economy, which I feel is just waiting to ignite if we, we get the bonds lifted from it. But I think my answer comes down to status shift, deal with it. And the other thing is, <coughs> stop going to those UN receptions. <laughs> I myself yeah. go out of my way not to go to New York those last two weeks of September. It's such a nightmare, <laughs> you know. But of course, when you're a New Yorker, you have to you have to pretend to welcome all these foreign diplomats to the East Side there. Boy, you hear wonderful things, especially about Obama. Uh, you know, when it's well, off the true. record and it's a true. foreign minister. My goodness, <laughs> Gary, say um, what? Yeah, I think it's it's a very important issue. It's, uh, you call it disruptive. I would probably say it's a big picture. Just to recognize that if you do something in Venezuela, it may hurt you in Iran or vice versa. If you do something in Iran, it may have effect in China. The world is interdependent. And trying to sort of to make compartments of your foreign policy, it's, uh, mm, it's deterrent to your strategic interest. You have to see the big picture and to start looking with different factors. China is very strong, but China-Russia coalition it's probably not very solid because eventually China is looking yeah. for Russia today as a junior partner, tomorrow as, 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 as a prey. Right. Because China is not even hiding its territorial uh, claims for at least half of Russian, Russian territory. <coughs> China is surrounded by all the natural enemies. So there are many opportunities to play the game. In 1991-1992, America was in the position to redesign the world. You know, if America had the same uh, sort of strategic zeal to play the role as in 1945, 1946, and just the years to come. Uh, 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 it's in the beginning of the Cold War. I think the world could be a much better place. But many years have been wasted. So now it's more difficult, but still, it's not late to start thinking about the world and coming up with a concept. It's strategy first. And uh, I hope that, you know, the future of U.S. presidency will be about the strategy. Just 
talking about all these countries. You mentioned countries of all continents. Well, you didn't mention any Africa, but that's also a very important rising continent. And looking at all these countries and recognizing how America can influence, it's more difficult now because you cannot make unilateral decisions, but there are so many allies that could, would love to join you if you show strength and commitment and credibility. Yes. Yeah, I think India is an important one. I happened to be there two, three years ago. I mean, it's the world's largest democracy, an amazing success story, both economically, China shares that, but also politically, <coughs> which China isn't really. And um, yeah, there's, I mean, Bush had a pretty good, I think, start there. It got a little bit swallowed up with the Middle East then. And Obama really didn't pay much attention there. And I think he's tried to fix it a little bit, but um, maybe this new government there could be a, a real opportunity. But I also think Gary's right. You've got to think strategically. And the pivot to Asia, I always, I mean, our summers in the Marine Corps just got out, and he thought the pivot, I mean, it was, the pivot to Asia seems, seems to practice to be literally 1,500 Marines in Darwin, Australia, which is not a serious <laughs> pivot. And they're not there all the time. They're not there all the time. It's a nice place, Darwin, I guess. Maybe it's not so nice. I don't know. It's the middle of nowhere in Australia, but it's probably better than some of the other places the Marines but hang that's out. That's a but Marine perspective. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. The Navy I'm sees it differently. The Navy sees it differently, <laughs> but if you, as you know better than I, the Navy says that's a very nice idea. We're for a pivot to Asia too, but with what ships are we supposed yeah, to be they're, pivoting? They're, they're, they, there's no actual pivot. Exactly there are right. not enough carriers and destroyers yeah, yeah. to pivot, and they're losing access and the anti-access yeah. problem. So, I mean, it it's really is a case where you could talk. It's not a conceptually bad idea. Yeah. Asia is extremely important. China, India, rising powers. It just it doesn't mean anything if there's no actual substance to it, and that's a, that's a problem. But yeah. I also wonder why we announce these things. Why would yeah, we exactly. announce, look at Europe and say, by the way, no, exactly. you're over. We've pivoted to well, Asia. I think Putin was interested what, by that, what too. What is that right? as, di as diplomacy? That's just immature, dumb stuff. Well, I think it's a way of saying also, the Middle East is a real mess. It's really an unpleasant place. The wars there haven't gone well. They don't seem at all grateful to us. And you know what? We're, like, we're leaving that behind somehow. We're, we're going to Asia, where all the big thinkers think it's really an important place, and they're real countries, and you can deal with them, Japan, India, China. It seems like a, it's a pseudo sort of strategic move. It is, it's yeah. not real strategy. It, it's yes, just but the middle of sounds that. good in an yeah, article in Foreign it, Affairs. It's yes, no it longer, it, 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 you can no longer uh, search for a solution for Middle East in the Middle East because Middle East means Iran, Iran means right. Russia. Right. And it's all, Absolutely. you know, it's, it's like a you know, Russian Matryoshka, so that you just, you have to go to the, to, 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 to the bottom of that. We should pivot to grand strategy. Last question, I'm told. One last, one word. Yeah, sir, uh, Jerry. Simple question. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're the non-American. No, no, no. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I don't know, so I mean, just, uh, I think he would... No, Please, Jimmy, yeah, you're, you're better at answering this than we are. Uh, um, John has given me this. Jerry, uh, we, we do get the question uh, often, um, what would Jack do about this or that? And uh, John Mueller said, you know what, the question, uh, respectfully, isn't what would Jack do now, it's what did Jack do? Um, and we know that he and Bill Bennett uh, stood up against Prop 187 in California. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so his, his concept, based on the American idea, was that this is a, a country that welcomes um, you know, and, uh, and, you know, we've got to secure the border, but it's not, I don't, I don't think, well, the bottom line is to say what John says, we know what Jack did. We don't know what he would do, um, but he would be engaged in the issue, and he really cared deeply that this continue to be a country of immigrants that recognizes the most important capital that we bring in, which is human capital. Um, people are uh, our greatest resource. Um, so, uh, no, that's good. Uh, that's yeah, good, Jimmy. That's and thank right. you for closing with that. And I think it's appropriately closed with the phrase human capital, which I always associate with Jack Kay. He's the only politician to have used the phrase human capital 36,000 times in, <laughs> in his political career. So it was appropriate to close with those thoughts of Jimmy's. Thank you all. Thank you, my thank fellow you. panelists.